So a little bit about me. Um, I started working at a company called Vordell about 18 months ago um, on a, a product called the uh, API server. And we got acquired by a company called Axway at the start of the year, and I came with them. Prior to that, I um, worked um, a lot, did a lot of consulting work uh, with web services, both in REST and SOAP. So the important thing is I've got no bias towards either. Each has got its place. Each has got its benefits and drawbacks. So we're going to go through some of those today. So let's look at some statistics. If we look at those, we can see that REST is massively more popular than SOAP. And at the moment, that gap is widening. But that's not the whole story. If we look at the financial category, we can see it's a fair bit closer to parity. And likewise in education, although that particular statistic comes from API Hub rather than programmable web. Now, this, these are just the open APIs that are publicly available that meet some of uh, Adam's three tests that he was talking about this morning. Now, although statistics are much harder to come by, if we look at what you might call dark or closed APIs, business to business, internal integrations, I imagine we'd see a far greater proportion of SOAP. So, let's look at some definitions. If you Google SOAP versus REST, and I imagine some of you with um, laptops or tablets are doing it right now, the first, response, first answer is a, a question on Stack Overflow asking about the differences. And a user called Nakiran uh, asks you to consider the, the actor Martin Lawrence as your data. And he goes on to suggest that Martin Lawrence, that using SOAP rather, is like Martin Lawrence in Big Mama's house. Has anyone seen it? One person. The rest of you. Oh, God, I feel sorry because it's a really bad film. Um, but he's saying that basically the amount of overhead and cruft that you add when you use soap over rest is like dressing up Martin Lawrence as a big fat lady. Whereas using rest is just like using Martin Lawrence. And I quite like this, but I'd like to suggest a different analogy. There was an, another really bad Martin Lawrence film called Black Knight. If you, look, if you look at the comments on that particular question, someone actually suggests that all, all computing concepts should be explained in terms of Martin Lawrence's films. <laughs> so I'm trying to run with that. Anyway, he gets transported back to medieval England where he has to act like a knight in armour. And um, I think that soap is more like armour. If you don't need a suit of armour, it's heavy, it's clunky, it can get in the way. But if someone's coming up you with a sword, it's kind of useful to be wearing it. I actually wanted to, I do own a sword, I wanted to bring it here, but BA said I couldn't put it in hand luggage, and I thought it was going to look a bit strange going around the baggage carousel. So, so armour also does a good job of getting you where you want to go. So there are circumstances where, despite its complexity and performance overhead, you might choose to use soap. What are they? And I should point out, when I'm talking about soap, I'm talking about the entire WS stack, not just soap itself, because um, a lot of the additional benefits of uh, soap come from using these technologies, standards rather. So first up is when you need serious security requirements. It's no co coincidence that the uh, usage of soap is far higher in the financial services sector. And as we saw earlier, a large number of business-to-business -business protocols use it. Uh, EBXML, HL7 in the healthcare sector, RosettaNet and AS2 are all built on SOAP. So, although the majority of web services still rely on, well, whether they're REST or SOAP, still rely on transport level security, there are cases where it isn't enough. And WS security provides a standard for signing and encrypting messages, ensuring the message hasn't been intercepted or tampered with, that the sender is who he says he is, and it also provides for non-repudiation. It's worth pointing out that both signing and encrypting a message is computationally expensive, even if you've got dedicated hardware. Um, if you're looking at this sort of thing and you're likely to be um, having multiple messages in a single interaction, you might want to use WS Secure Conversation instead. So two circumstances where WS Security would be absolutely required would be where there was an untrusted SOAP intermediary or when a non-HTTP transport was being involved and end-to-end -end security was still required. Which brings me on to my second point. Because REST uses HTTP as its application protocol, it's the only choice for the transport level protocol. Now, SOAP has the advantage of being transport independent. You can use it over FTP, JMS, MQ, SMTP, and um, even more obscure protocols. And in the example I want to walk you through later, communication from the receiving server and the DMZ and the backend ESB is via SOAP over JMS, for example. So there's also going to be occasions when you need to guarantee delivery of a message, regardless of network failures or timeouts or you need to make sure that duplicate messages aren't received. In these circumstances, you can use WS Reliable Messaging. 
you can specify a um, delivery assurance level. So just look at a couple of these. At least once guarantees a message will get to its destination, you do run the risk that multiple messages will be received. On the other hand, at most once, um, doesn't guarantee delivery, but it does guarantee that you won't get duplicates. And another one, exactly once, guarantees it will get there. There won't be a duplicate, but you run the highest risk of failure or generating an error. Finally, just some other reasons. Um, WS addressing allows easy asynchronous transactions via the reply to header. And some other considerations are the strongly typed nature of a WSDL allows automatic generation of stub code by development environments or testing tools. Um, I think we're all here for the SOAP UI talk this morning. Um, I've been using it for 10 years, so it was really cool to meet the guy that uh, is in charge of it. And lastly, there's the UDDI specification service description and uh, standardized service catalogs, though I'll admit not that many people are using it. Now, neither of these last two are particularly reasons for choosing a SOAP-based architecture. So, having looked at why you might want to use SOAP, let's do the same for REST. I thought long and hard about coming up with a list of reasons about the benefits of REST, but really it boils down to because you don't need any of the added features of SOAP that I've just been discussing. I don't think anyone here is going to argue with the facts that SOAP is more complicated, it's more computationally expensive, and it involves significantly larger payloads, which is certainly an issue when you're talking about mobile applications. So although you could say IDEs like Visual Studio and Eclipse still seem to push you towards SOAP, pretty much any programming language is going to support HTTP transactions, meaning a REST service is going to give you a develop greater developer mindshare. And a lot of the issues that the WS stack uh, addresses for SOAP, they're being worked on for REST. Uh, we've had talks on OAuth, OpenID Connect, and some stuff on Skim coming up, I think. And they're all being identified, uh, adopted in the Identity Federation space, and they're replacing heavier protocols. On the security piece, client certificates can go a long way. Um, and there are approaches for um, securing, for, sorry, for asynchronous transactions, um, or ones where there's a high risk of latency. Now, I backed myself into a corner when I came up with the title of this, because I realized I had to talk about hypermedia, too. And really, it should be covered by REST, because a fully RESTful API implements a hypermedia model. Oh, someone said yes, I like that. <laughs> uh, but the vast majority of what we describe as RESTful APIs aren't truly REST, which is why people talk about high and low REST, or pragmatic REST. Now, to be clear, when I talk about hypermedia, hypermedia APIs, I'm referring to the constraint on the fourth level of the Richardson maturity model, because I have no idea how to pronounce hate your ass. Anyone? hate -os? hate your ass OK. Anyway, it stands for hypertext as the engine of application state. Um, concept comes from Roy Fielding's famous paper on REST. And as I'm going to massively simplify it, and this guy's probably going to shout at me for doing so. Um, but it means serving links out with a requested resource, detailing what a client can do with that resource. So when I do a get on a product in a company's catalog API, like so, it could return with information on the product, along with links describing what can be done with that product. In this case, we've been given a link to order the product via the API. And if for some reason the product wasn't available to order, that link shouldn't be served out by the API. And the client shouldn't, should know not to display an order, should not know not to display the order link to the user. In this example, by the way, 501 is my customer number, hence it being part of the API call. Just remove that for simplicity. This can be really powerful, and if used well, can help to future-proof APIs, as well as user, uh, improve user experience of an app. So, by listing the available applications from an initial get on the service, we can dynamically generate a map of the API. Someone was talking this morning about graphing APIs. You could do it automatically, graphing um, hypermedia APIs should be able to be able to do it automatically from a single starting point. Decoupling, and in the same way that you can change the target of a link on a website without changing the user experience, you can modify the links and hence your API structure without breaking the apps that use it. And extensibility. You can add additional capabilities to an API response, again, without breaking apps, existing apps. And smartly designed APIs should be able to, might be able to automatically take advantage of this new capability. And Ronnie put it nicely this morning when he was talking about it, designing for the apps of yesterday, which is um, something I'm going to steal. But it does lead on to the first disadvantage, or at least the first perceived disadvantage. 
There's a perception that using this model effectively means driving the user experience from the API, removing some of the flexibility from the app developer. Again, Ronnie was talking about this this morning. Does it change into um, machine experience design, MX design? Likewise, you could argue that it breaks the client-server model. And finally, building APIs and apps to take advantage of this model is just simply harder than accessing static endpoints. Even Roy Fielding acknowledged this in a comment on his blog a few years ago. And in fact, I, saw, I was sat at the back of the room earlier and I saw someone actually had this article up that this comment appears under. He's effectively stating that doing it right for the long term, it takes longer than doing it right for right now. God knows I don't want to put words in his mouth, though. So if you want to know more about this, um, then obviously Roy Fielding, who kicked the whole rest thing off, he still writes extensively around it. Steve Klabnik, uh posts some great presentations and articles in a really accessible style. He's also got a really good ebook available on it. And um, Axway's own Mark O'Neill, who I know some of the guys in the room know, he frequently blogs on this sort of and related subjects. And he seems to be fairly entertaining and light-hearted when he does. And on the subject of this, back to the rest versus soap debate. With all of this said, it doesn't have to be an either-or choice. Like I said, Mark O'Neill, he blogged last week on what he calls the API mullet. Now, for anyone that doesn't know, a mullet was a hairstyle popular in the 1980s. featured short hair at the front and long at the back. Business in the front, party in the rear. That's not Mark O'Neill, though he did post a photo of me up on his blog. Uh, post a photo up on his blog um, with labelled as me, with which was uh, Chris Waddle, an English footballer with a mullet. So I probably should have captioned that as him. Anyway, he described a reverse mullet for APIs, giving the best of both worlds. Rest out front for ease of developer use, openness, speed, interaction with mobile devices, and so on. And soap in the back for the heavyweight business interactions with back-end systems. Pete from Intel was actually talking about this sort of thing this morning. He was describing servicing APIs. And that's the use case I want to present to you today. So Essen are, sorry, they're the Netherlands' largest supplier of sustainable energy. They're part of the RWE group. They supply four million customers with natural gas and electricity, as well as heating and energy services. Their challenge was to expose legacy systems to the wider world. Adopting a SOA approach, they used an internal service bus to create a service layer and make these legacy services available to a more modern, rich UI technology, such as Ajax, JSON, REST. The decoupled nature allowed them great flexibility in publishing and evolving the services they exposed to the outside world, while keeping the stability and maintainability of their back-end systems. Now, why did they do this? Uh, referring to the roundtable discussion we had before lunch, um, it was a business case, and it was added value as a competitive differentiation. Their competitors weren't doing this sort of thing. And we're going to see some of the things that they're actually doing using this um, model. But looking at their architecture, we can see that they've got four separate channels for their employees, customers, partners, and the public. We're going to look at each of these in turn. But the point to hear, note here is the multiple protocols and authentication methods. So the partners connect mostly via SOAP, secured using WS Security and X509 certificates. Now, that didn't have to change when they implemented this API layer. We're still pushing it through in the same way. Employees use SAML and OpenSSO to access both SOAP and REST-based services. And customers use REST services uh, using session ID security. And the public have free access to these services. Um, there's no additional security in place. Now, the other point to note is that although these services are exposed out as a mixture of SOAP and REST, mainly via XML or JSON, all communication with the service bus is via SOAP and XML. And the API layer uh, provides the translation between the protocols and the content types, which is a big part of what enables them to maintain the stability of the back end while delivering out this flexible content. Now, since I'm here representing a vendor in the space, it's probably not going to surprise you to know that we supply the technology that allows them to do this. But because this is supposed to be a vendor-neutral talk, I should point out that other vendors do very similar things, and several of them are represented here. So, there we go. That's my back covered. So, uh, what are their employees doing? Um, the APIs are used by applications for employees. They're exposed publicly, but they do require the employee to sign in. The authentication is then conducted against a central back-end repository. And a SAML assertion is, is um, inserted into a cookie that's passed through with each API request. And the example on screen here is a timesheeting application with an external facing web application connecting to their back end time recording and billing system. We can see that business, business, business to business interactions, either directly from partners or from partner applications, are purely SOAP based with messages signed using WS security for authenticity and non repudiation. 
They're allow allowing partners to integrate with their in own incident management systems, um, with their internal incident management systems. They're integrating with Salesforce, and they've also got some records from electric car, charging, car charging points, which I'm going to come back to that one later. Now, finally, as I, meant, well, not finally, as I mentioned earlier, their customer-facing APIs um, are all exposed using REST, even though the back-end application is driving them as SOAP. The content type depends on the target device, JSON for mobile devices, XML for the web. And the content type mediation is provided at the API's management layer, meaning fewer changes to these back-end systems. Now, it's also worth, worth noting, we were talking about smart metering this morning, and they, this also falls into this category. The customer smart meters, they're calling into Essence APIs to report usage data. And this means that customers can view their usage in real time using the web or a mobile app. And again, referring back to the roundtable this morning, um, I think it was Ellen that asked the question, what if we want to use the info that an energy company collects on our usage? And this is what Essence are allowing them to do. As we can see here, um, there are a number of applications that are available to the public. No authentication is required on the APIs. And they're also allowing third-party developers to create stuff against um, some of these APIs. You know, people are going to do stuff with your data that you didn't think of if you expose it out. However, Essent have created a couple of these, uh, several applications themselves. Uh, one example, they've got a network of car charging points all around the Netherlands, um, various Dutch cities. And they know in real time whether any of these are being used. And they've exposed that out as a web service. And what they've done at the API layer, layer is uh, create a mashup. And uh, what was it? Uh, map mashup mania that was mentioned in Adam's first talk this morning. Um, but it's exactly what they're doing. You provide your location via your mobile device, and it will tell you uh, where the nearest car charging point is. And when we talk about things like connected cars, this is going to be built in there. It's going to automatically tell you via this sort of technology. So although these, this list here is the generic benefits that Essent have listed um, as getting the benefit from this specific API management pr platform, several come specifically from uh, using this uh, hybrid REST SOAP approach. Uh, with a lighter touch of REST, you can scale better. And its simplicity means your mobile apps can be developed faster. And finally, by maintaining your legacy SOAP infrastructure, you can maintain existing connections with partners while extending the services out by translating them to REST for future applications. As we saw right at the start, in terms of public open APIs, REST is much more popular than SOAP. But when we look at uh, sensitive areas such as finance APIs, and especially private and B2B APIs, SOAP's still there in strength. And there are reasons for that. The WS stack provides options around security, non-repudiation, guaranteed, deliver so, guaranteed delivery, and so on, that they still aren't fully available using a REST-based approach. And it's still available for transports other than HTTP. But with all that said, if you don't need them, then REST can make things easier both for API developers, app developers, and consumers. And finally, a hybrid approach can give you the best of both worlds. Using the, using the heavyweight SOAP-based protocols for your backend and your existing services, and creating an additional layer for the lighter weight services and authentication protocols using an API platform technology. Fairly short and sweet. I'm here for most of the two days. Um, I'm going to be having a drink tonight. Uh, uh, come over, have a chat with me, have a chat with the guys on the Axeway stand. Thanks. Thanks for that.